Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Mark Latunsky? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Mark David Latunsky was born on March 28, 1969, and lived in Morris, Michigan. This is about 30 minutes east of Lansing. His father was a farmer who raised beef cattle. Mark did well in school. He was exceptionally intelligent. Years later, an intelligence test would reveal that his IQ was 127. This score is higher than 96.4% of the population. Mark graduated high school as valedictorian in 1987. He went to college in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. In 1991, he graduated with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Mark then attended college in Iowa. In 1995, he earned a master's degree in physical and organic chemistry. He found a job as a research chemist with an ink manufacturer in Flint, Michigan. One could argue that Mark was really making his mark. Mark became romantically involved with a woman named Emily. After about a year, they bought a house on five acres just outside of Morris, Michigan. The couple married in 2001. They had four children from 2003 to 2010, a son, then three daughters. Sometime around 2007, Mark started working as a chemist and lab manager for a chemical company in Fowlerville, about 25 minutes from his home. In 2010, Emily noticed that Mark's behavior was changing. He was making irrational statements. For example, he thought that people were spying on him. He believed that he was going to inherit a massive trust fund put in place by his family. And he believed that he was not actually his mother's son. Rather, he was his mother's brother. Emily encouraged her husband, Mark, to receive mental health assistance. He was treated with medication, but then discontinued using it right away. At around the same time, Mark admitted to Emily that he had been having affairs with men that he met online. The couple started sleeping in separate beds and attended counseling, but their situation did not improve. Mark's mental health symptoms became worse. He thought that Emily was part of a conspiracy run by the people in charge of the trust fund that he was supposed to inherit. Emily finally had enough of Mark after he reported her to Child Protective Services, claiming that she had engaged in child neglect. Emily said the report was false. She took the children and moved out, and in May 2012, she filed for divorce. The court awarded Mark unsupervised visits with his children. In late August 2013, he took two of his children to a water park and refused to return them. The police arrested Mark and charged him with kidnapping. In 2014, he was found incompetent to stand trial. Later, he was found competent, but the charges were dismissed anyway. In 2015, Mark married a man named Jamie Arnold. The couple separated in September 2019. Throughout all these different mental health difficulties, Mark was able to keep his job. His employer tolerated his unusual behavior for many years. But in February 2019, they ran out of patience and fired him. Mark had accused them of contaminating the products he had made, and he denied his children were his. Mark was desperate for money after being fired. He tried working as a contractor and as a handyman, but he was not having success. He even tried working as a male escort. At some point, Mark started fantasizing about cannibalism. He just couldn't stop thinking about it. It was eating him up inside. Mark built a secret room in his basement, apparently for the purpose of engaging in this fantasy. On October 10, 2019, a man called 911 after running from Mark's house. He said that Mark had tied him up in his basement, but he declined to press charges. On October 25, another man ran away from Mark's house and called 911. He also declined to press charges. The police were unable to build a case against Mark. Now let's take a look at the background of Kevin Bacon, who became an important figure in this case 
at this point in the narrative. Kevin Bacon was born on November 28, 1994. His father was named Carl Bacon, and his mother was named Pamela Van Horn. He had an older sister named Jennifer. Kevin Bacon, of course, shares a name with a famous actor who was in movies like Footloose, Apollo 13, Stir of Echoes, and Hollow Man. Kevin's father said that he wanted his son to have the same initials as he did, KB, but he did not want to name him Carl Jr. This is why he selected the name Kevin Bacon. It wasn't because of the actor, Kevin Bacon. Carl suggested that the actor wasn't quite as famous when his son was born as he would later become. This is mostly true. Footloose came out in 1984 and made the actor Kevin Bacon a star, but then Kevin Bacon's career went into a slump and did not recover until the mid to late 1990s. Either way, the Kevin Bacon in this story graduated from high school in 2013. He was highly interested in beauty and hairstyling. Kevin graduated from a hair academy and went to work in a salon in Schwartz Creek, Michigan, which is just west of Flint. He enrolled in college and studied psychology. Kevin suffered from a number of mental health difficulties, including depression. In late November 2019, Kevin was admitted to a mental hospital. He was discharged on December 2. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On December 23, 2019, Kevin connected with Mark on the app Grinder. This was just 21 days after Kevin had been discharged from the mental hospital. Kevin told Mark that he was interested in being tied up and experiencing a complete loss of control. He wanted multiple men to be involved. Mark said that he could fulfill Kevin's fantasy. The next day, December 24, the men met at a shopping center. Kevin sent a text message to a friend of his at 6.12 p.m., which was just before he left with Mark. It was clear from the message that Kevin thought he was going to have fun that evening and would be interacting with multiple men. What Kevin did not know is that no other men were involved. It was just Mark. He also did not know that Mark had a different fantasy in mind. Kevin may have been consumed by desire, but Mark had a desire to consume. Mark took Kevin to his house and killed him with a knife. After this, Mark removed, cooked, and ate Kevin's testicles. He left Kevin's body hanging by the ankles in his secret room in the basement. On Christmas Day at 2.15 a.m., Mark texted a friend of his and admitted to killing Kevin Bacon. The friend did not appear to understand that Mark was being serious. Kevin's family reported him missing after he didn't show up for Christmas breakfast at 9 a.m. The police were able to track Kevin's online activity and received a tip about Mark. The police paid Mark a visit on December 27, 2019. They found the secret room in the basement with Kevin's body inside of it. Mark confessed to killing Kevin with a knife. He said that he planned to put the various body parts to good use. Mark was arrested and charged with murder. About three years later, he was found guilty of first-degree murder. On December 15, 2022, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Mark's ex-wife indicated that before Mark's symptoms emerged, he was a gentle, considerate, and kind individual. The family had a normal life for the area where they lived. They raised various animals on their property like rabbits, chickens, ducks, and goats. The family would take vacations to Disney World. There was no indication that Mark would become homicidal someday. He worked hard at his job. He provided for his family. He did not appear to be abnormal. This makes it seem as though Mark's mental illness is what caused him to become a killer. Item number two, in some murder cases that involve mental disorders, mental health treatment clinicians never really had a chance to intervene. The killer never sought treatment. They were never forced to participate in treatment. Therefore, no one knew what was going on. No one witnessed the descent into a hazardous frame of mind. This is not what happened in this case. Mark had an extensive journey through the mental health system. The way he was treated highlighted the inefficiency of the system and the inaccuracy of mental health assessment. Let's take a look at his treatment history. 
In May of 2012, Mark was involuntarily hospitalized for mental health symptoms. In June of that year, he was mandated to receive outpatient treatment. Clearly, clinicians must have believed that he was mentally ill, and almost certainly that he had a disorder which would not be expected to improve dramatically, for example, schizophrenia. Despite this, in April of 2013, he was evaluated again and found to have no significant mental disorders. So they were not simply saying that he had no mental health symptoms. They were saying that he did not have any disorders. He made a remarkable and just about impossible recovery. In September of 2013, Mark was involuntarily hospitalized after being charged with kidnapping in August. In October of 2013, a mental health clinician reported that Mark had no significant signs of mental illness. Once again, Mark's condition turned around. He was in good shape. There was no cause for concern. In April of 2014, Mark was found incompetent to stand trial on the kidnapping charge. In September of that year, he was found walking naked in public and involuntarily hospitalized. The next month, he was found competent to stand trial on the kidnapping charge. For some reason, the charge was dismissed anyway. It was almost like no one could decide if Mark was actually mentally ill or not. They kept going back and forth. Several years later, on July 19, 2019, Mark was arrested for failing to pay child support. Records from the jail indicated that he was not suffering from any mental health issue. After having two different men call the police after escaping his house, one in October and one in November, Mark was arrested again for failing to pay child support. This was on December 10. On December 27, 2019, he was arrested for murder. In January of 2020, he was found incompetent to stand trial. In April of that year, he was found competent to stand trial. There is this sense that Mark did not make a great effort to convince people that he was or was not mentally ill. It wasn't like he went out of his way to be deceptive, yet no one could agree on his mental health status. Ultimately, Mark was diagnosed with schizophrenia, borderline personality traits, major depressive disorder with psychotic features, and adjustment disorder with mixed anxiety and depressed mood. Here again, we see an unusual assessment. Typically, when somebody is diagnosed with major depressive disorder, they are not additionally diagnosed with adjustment disorder. Item number three, Mark was responsible for the murder, but some people have pointed out that Kevin made some decisions which were not in his best interest. If he had made different decisions, he may have survived. Kevin took a dramatic risk by specifically seeking out someone to fulfill a dangerous fantasy. His fantasy wasn't the same as Mark's, but it was still hazardous. Mark's defense in the murder case was that Kevin no longer wanted to be alive. This was not murder. This was Mark following Kevin's directions. This is an interesting argument, one that ultimately failed, but there was some evidence to support this claim. Kevin was described as depressed, not liking his body, and struggling with relationships. He had low self-esteem and chronic money problems. He frequently engaged in what was described by his friends as dangerous sexual behavior. He did this for several years. Some people believed that it was only a matter of time before he was seriously harmed or died as a result. Many of these characteristics and behaviors supported Mark's argument, but Kevin engaged in another behavior that hurt Mark's defense. Namely, before he left with Mark, Kevin confirmed that Mark did not intend on harming him. In theory, Kevin could have changed his mind later, but his initial fantasy had nothing to do with dying. Mark, on the other hand, was clearly preparing for something homicidal. After arranging to meet with Kevin, Mark made several internet searches that did not help his case. For example, he searched for butcher knives, hunting knives, razor-sharp knives, and daggers. I think Mark was fantasizing about this type of murder for a long time, and Kevin just happened to be an easy target. Kevin did not know that Mark was planning on killing him. Item number four, Mark's fantasy about cannibalism appeared to be his motive for the murder. He was not angry at Kevin. He wasn't trying to steal from Kevin. It was all about the fantasy. 
was this fantasy consistent with Mark's diagnosis, or was it unrelated? Research tells us that this particular fantasy has a strong association with psychotic illnesses, including schizophrenia. I think that Mark developed this fantasy due to the psychosis. He probably did not have the fantasy before the onset of schizophrenia. Now moving to my final thoughts. The case of Mark Lutunsky demonstrates how mental health symptoms in different people can converge and result in disaster. Mark's mental illness made him fantasize about being homicidal. Kevin's mental illness made him fantasize about being vulnerable. Both men were failed by the mental health system. Their experiences highlight how there is a lot of room for improvement in the areas of assessment and treatment. Those are my thoughts on the case of Mark Latunsky. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.